Good morning, everyone. Feels like a school, <laughs> Sunday school of sorts. Uh, so today we're talking about uh, the first signpost of the New Testament, which is Christ and cross. And then particularly we're focusing on Christ's death. Uh, so the third point there. And then yeah, next week, as Andrew mentioned, I'll be covering off his resurrection and his ascension as well. So Christ's death. This is the climax. This is the high point of the entire Bible. Everything has been leading up to this point throughout history, throughout the Bible, and has been looking toward the Messiah. And everything after this looks back to what Jesus has done. Um, and just to begin, we need to remember the promises of God before we get into how they were fulfilled. So just a few uh few ones, there's so many promises that Jesus fulfills, but just three ones I wanted to point out is that there's God's promise to Adam. So the seed of the woman will crush the serpent's head. Uh, so we see that in, in Jesus. So there's God's promise to Abraham. From you will come kings and all the nations will be blessed uh, through your seed. And that's reiterated to Isaac and Jacob as well. And then it's God's promise to David an everlasting kingdom to stay in David's line. And we see Jesus as that everlasting king. So as Pastor Andrew has mentioned throughout the journey through the Old Testament, the people were always in anticipation of the one who would come to crush the serpent's head, to reverse the curse. Each person down the line had failed. They were unable to fulfill the requirements that God had for them unable to start fresh, despite the number of opportunities that God gave them. Now all the promises, all the pictures, they point to Jesus as the one who fulfills all God's requirements. The requirements to the law, both ceremonial and moral. And he lived the perfect life, as we saw a couple of weeks ago. The whole sacrificial system points to him, the tabernacle points to him, the temple. They all point to something much greater, all that is, that is Jesus and his work. Um, and that work of Jesus is the topic of today's class. So each of the four Gospels focus on Christ's death and resurrection. They spend a significant amount of time in that section. Um, almost half of the book of John is dedicated to the last week of his life um, and a significant amount of the other Gospels as well because it's so significant, they spend so much time in it and how necessary it was and what the results of that were. Uh, so we'll dig into to some of the details that they go through in sequence um, and just to set the stage because they follow along so closely with some of the Old Testament prophecies like uh, Isaiah 53 and Psalm 22, among many others. Uh, but we'll read through Isaiah 53, just to set the stage for um, what exactly happens. Isaiah 53. Who has believed what he has heard from us? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he grew up before him like a young plant and like a root out of dry ground. He had no form or majesty that we should look at him and no beauty that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And he and as one from men uh, whom men hide their faces, he was despised and we esteemed him not. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions, he was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace, and with his wounds we are healed. All we, like sheep, have gone astray, we have turned every one to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him 
the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. Like a lamb that is led to the slaughter and like a sheep that is before its shearers is silent, so he opened not his mouth. By oppression and judgment he was taken away. And as for his generation, who considered that he was cut off of the land of the living, stricken for the transgression of my people. And they made his grave with the wicked and with a rich man in his death, although he had done no violence and there was no deceit in his mouth. Yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him. He has put him to grief. When his soul makes an offering for guilt, he shall see his offspring. He shall prolong his days. The will of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. Out of the anguish of his soul we shall see and be satisfied. By his knowledge shall true righteousness, the, shall the, true, the righteous one, my servant, make many to be accounted righteous. He shall bear their iniquities. Therefore I will divide him a portion with the many, and he, will, he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he poured out his soul to death and was numbered with the transgressors. Yet he bore the sin of many and makes intercession for the transgressors. So that's Isaiah 53, um, and that really sets the stage for, for what we see. Uh, so we'll start with how it all comes about, and that's the traitor. So Judas was one of the twelve apostles, one specifically called by Jesus to be a messenger, to take the gospel out and to, glare, to declare the coming of the kingdom of God. Yet it was clear that he was never truly saved. The other apostles were. Um, he put a great show on for them. Everyone else believed that he was saved. Uh, but even that, uh, this too was prophesied that Jesus, the Messiah, would be betrayed by one close to him. And that's in Psalm 41.9. And then on the very night that they celebrated Passover, remembering the lamb that would cover them and allow the wrath of God to pass over them, this is the night that Judas went out to betray him. He went out to the Pharisees and took his opportunity to deliver Jesus to them, for 30 pieces of silver. That's a significant amount of money. Uh, perhaps around four months uh, wages for a laborer. But betraying the king of heaven for something so temporary, so small, is just another example and it proves how much Judas didn't understand about who Jesus was. Despite him being actually witness to the miracles day by day, uh, to all the private conversations, to all the clear explanations that he gave to the disciples. So after the Passover meal, Judas left while the other disciples were still with Jesus, while they were having lengthy discussions about many things. And then Jesus left that place and went to the Mount of Olives. Um, and he took that opportunity to pray in the Garden of Gethsemane. This time of prayer for Jesus was a time of great agony, um, knowing what he was about to go through, not denying that he had to do it, but desiring a way for it to be accomplished that did not require the Father and the Son to be separated, even for an instant. So after he was done praying and rebuking his disciples for not praying and staying awake with him, Judas came to find Jesus at the Mount of Olives. But instead of Coming just with the chief priests who wanted to arrest him, they came with a, a group of soldiers, uh, a Roman guard. And they came with servants as well because they were expecting a great rebellion from, from the people who followed Jesus, uh, despite it being the middle of the night. So Judas identifies Jesus as a rabbi, as a teacher, uh, despite him not really caring about his teaching at all. Uh, and kisses him to signal to the religious leaders that this was Jesus. And again, they knew already who Jesus was. Jesus responds calmly to them, 
reservedly, rationally, and saying in Mark 14, 48 and 49, Have you come out as against a robber, with swords and clubs to capture me? Day after day, I was coming, I was with you in the temple teaching, and you did not seize me. But let the scriptures be fulfilled. And that's in uh, the Psalm 41, 9 that I mentioned before. So Jesus went with them willingly, despite the resistance of Peter and the other disciples to bring swords upon the people that came to arrest him. But Jesus said, don't do that. And he acted with compassion even on the servant and healed the servant's ear. And then when Jesus did that, the the disciples fled and scattered. Um, And that's to fulfill Zechariah 13, 7 saying when the shepherd is taken, the, the, the sheep will scatter. So then that leads on to the next one, which is the trial. So he had various trials, uh, the first one of which was actually before the, the religious leaders, so the Jewish leaders of the day. Then there was a short trial before the Roman governor Pilate, and then he had a short trial again uh, not again, but before Herod. Um, This one's only recorded in Luke. And then again before Pilate, before the crowds, uh, immediately before he's taken to the cross. So the first trial, uh, recorded in all four of the Gospels, um, shows Jesus before the religious leaders. Uh, Luke records that they actually bring several witnesses against him. So these are false witnesses who are actually coerced or paid uh, to bring a false testimony before Jesus so that they can condemn him for something that that he hasn't really done. Uh, But none of that was sufficient to declare him guilty, as nothing would be since he's uh, blameless. But it didn't even agree with the other testimonies that were there at the time. They couldn't get their story straight, and that wasn't enough to condemn him there and then. And at first, Jesus doesn't answer the testimonies. He doesn't give a reply. He doesn't give a response. But then when he's questioned directly about whether he's the Son of God, he doesn't deny it, but he affirms it. And that essentially seals his fate in their eyes. He's committed the ultimate blasphemy by calling himself God. Again, something that he's done throughout um, his life and ministry. An extra detail is recorded in John saying that Jesus pointed the religious leaders to the the testimony of the people who had heard him day by day. The people who had heard his teaching because they can testify about what he has taught. They don't have to to, uh, question him because they can question the countless people who have heard his teaching. Anyway, at this point, the council still needs to decide what they're to do with him despite them already declare him him uh, guilty. But what they do from there is they actually take him to Pilate, uh, the Roman governor. They hand him over to Gentiles, uh, despite their own law being able to, to stone him by that means. But that wasn't in God's plan uh, to do that. So then the second trial uh, was before Pilate. This was brief and it was... As soon as dawn broke on that day, essentially, that they took him to to Pilate, they would have been knocking on his door, making sure that he was up and he had to deal with this problem as soon as possible. And then he questions Jesus, Pilate does, whether he is the king of the Jews. And Jesus has the simple response, you have said so. There's more detail added again in some of the Gospels, uh, in John specifically, where Jesus explains that he is indeed a king, but not one of this world. And that essentially, that calms Pilate down. It's like, well, if you're not a king of this world, I don't have anything to worry about you. You're not going to take over Caesar. You're not going to take over my rule over this area. It doesn't conflict with, conflict with what he's doing. So he essentially says, you have done nothing worthy of death. Uh, He finds no guilt in him. 
and then sends him to Herod as he's a Galilean it's from that region. Um, and this, this is the third trial before Herod. So it's only recorded in Luke um, in, with, before King Herod. And he was in Jerusalem at that time, probably because most of the Galileans were actually in Jerusalem anyway for the Passover, despite him being the ruler um, of a region not really that close. So Herod wanted to hear and see the things that Jesus taught and the things that Jesus did. Um, but upon Jesus having no response and doing no miracles, uh, he had no response to, to Herod, essentially. But Herod, too, declared him not worthy of death, nor guilty of any of the accusations. And then the final trial was before Pilate. So Herod essentially sent him back to, to Pilate. And Pilate, at this point, almost pleads with the Jews. Um, and even his wife had a dream that Pilate is have to, to have nothing to do with Jesus, all this trial. So he pleads with the Jews to let Jesus go again, declaring him that he is not guilty. Um, I didn't find guilt in him, neither did Herod. Why are you still pursuing this? But the, the crowds prevail against him and persuade him not only to flog him, as if that wasn't enough punishment for a sinless man, but also to crucify him. This was ultimately so that Pilate wouldn't be the cause of riots or seen as being the enemy of Caesar. So Jesus is sent to be crucified and Barabbas is released according to their custom. And just a little note on Barabbas. In Aramaic, um, Barabbas actually means son of the father. Um, and this was a murderer, an insurrectionist, someone who had actually caused pain to a lot of people. And this earthly son of the father was exchanged for the son of the son of God the Father, the perfect, sinless son of the Father. So it's a picture of that great exchange, that that God the Father sends His Son, and the true Son of God uh, takes the place of the true Son of an earthly father, the Son of Man. Um, and that that takes place for each one of us as we are rebels against God. And it's while we're still sinners that Christ died for us. So that leads on to the testimony. So there are a few testimonies that we hear um, just about what has happened in this, in this point. And I'm specifically trying to mention the things that people have said about Jesus and also the things that Jesus has said himself. So we heard the false testimonies already, the testimonies of Herod and Pilate saying that he's guiltless. And there are a few others as well. So as Jesus is beaten and delivered to be crucified, the soldiers mock him by dressing him up in kingly garb with robe and crown, and they beat him. This is awful, but it speaks of the true reality that he is the king, the king of the Jews. And then what Jesus did was act as a perfect and servant king, even while they were beating him. And then when Jesus was crucified, they hung a, they hung a sign above him um, in the three languages of the day, Greek, Aramaic, and Latin, saying, this is the king of the Jews. Again, a true testimony. Um, but this was to the dismay of the religious leaders because they said, no, you should take it down or you should at least change it to say, this is the one who said he was the king of the Jews. They also cast lots for his clothing and divided the other parts, just as uh, 20, Psalm 22, 18 says would happen to the Messiah. And then there's the testimony from those around him while on the cross, people calling him out, ca calling for him to save himself or to save himself and them, um, as with one of the men on the cross, while the other man on the cross, he is, he is actually repentant and acknowledges that he is the true king. He is innocent. And unlike the man being crucified, he is actually not deserving of the punishment that this man is getting. And then after Jesus dies, there's the Roman soldier 
witnessing Jesus' death and he cries out, Surely this man was the Son of God. Or in Luke, it's saying, Surely this man was innocent. So that, again, acknowledging his true identity, something that the religious leaders could not do. So then there's the testimony of Jesus. So I want to focus just on a couple of phrases that Jesus actually said while he was on the cross. Uh, the first one uh, is recorded in, in Mark and Matthew. Eloi, Eloi, lima sabachthani. So that's taken directly from Psalm 22, 1. So my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? So here Jesus is showing that he not only fulfills the prophecy of Psalm 22, that God has forsaken him, turned his face away from his begotten son, even for a short time. Uh, and because God has made Jesus, who had no sin, to become sin for us, that's why that the face was turned away. Because God can have no part with with sin. He can have no communion with sin. So when the sinless Son of God is made to be sin, uh, that communion, that fellowship was broken, and that was that forsaking. Um, and then he took that punishment that we deserved, that death, so that we could receive life that we could never deserve, and we were given his record instead of our own. So the next one, Jesus says, it is finished. This is known as the great exchange, and Jesus declaring this is saying that it has been completed. It is finished. The account has been paid, and now it is in infinite surplus, showing that his propitiation, the work done to atone for our sins and bringing us into favor with God, just as the sprinkling of the blood on the mercy seat was a picture of on the Day of Atonement. We're shown that that is completed. So the next one, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Jesus has compassion for the lost, despite them crucifying him, and then he intercedes for them, just as he continues to do for us while, uh, while he's in heaven. And this point is made clear in Romans as well, um, as 5.8 says that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. And then the last one, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. So this last one is significant too. It's not that Jesus simply died and his body gave out. We know that the other man crucified on his left and right lasted longer and their legs had to be broken to prove that they uh, or to make sure that they died more quickly so they couldn't gasp for air any longer. But Jesus gives up his spirit. After he has completed the work of atonement and the great exchange, after his work is done, he freely gives up his life, a true and willing sacrifice. This again acknowledging his true sovereignty over the situation and indeed everything. Um, and this is what Jesus says himself that he would do in John 10, 14 to 18. So he says, I am the good shepherd. I know my own and my own know me. Just as the father knows me and I know the father, I laid down my life for the sheep. And I have sheep that are not of this fault. I must bring them also. And they will listen to my voice. So that there will be one flock, one shepherd, for this reason the Father loves me, because I lay down my life, that I may take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have authority to lay it down, and I have authority to take it up again. This charge I received from my Father. So clearly Jesus gave up his own spirit willingly. He didn't die the way that you or I would die. So this brings us to our final point, termination. You notice they're all T's, it just makes sense. Uh, but it's the way that it all comes to a culmination, the, the, the result, what happens at the end. So the results of Christ's death are evident in the events that occurred. First of all, the events link back to the Passover. 
and this was being celebrated at this exact time. There was darkness over the land until from noon until 3 p.m., just like the ninth plague in Exodus. And then there was the death of the firstborn of the father, the true Passover lamb. And this corresponds to the tenth plague in Exodus. So the true Passover lamb covers the sin of all who would call on his name, those who trust in the lamb. And this was also on the same day that the Passover lambs were being slaughtered in Jerusalem so that they could put the blood over the doorposts. Uh, This is happening at the same time that the one who would cover us for our sin is no coincidence. And uh, some have said that there would have been rivers of blood from the thousands of lambs that would have been slaughtered and it would have flowed directly behind where uh, Golgotha is or the, the cross would have been. And then Jesus' testimony that it is finished is the victory cry, that the wrath of God has been poured out on him, the payment has been made, and now there was free access to God for all who believe in him. This is represented by the curtain in the temple being torn in two from top to bottom, showing that there is no longer need for sacrifices, no longer need for the Day of Atonement, nor any of the other pictures pointing to Christ. As Christ has finished the work, he became the ultimate sacrifice, the ultimate voluntary, perfect sacrifice. The only one that could fulfill, who could fully atone for the sin of mankind. (coughs) The rebellion of man against a holy and infinite God equates to an infinite payment that needed to be made. And Jesus, being God, was the only one who could pay that cost. And the only one, being perfect man as well, who could truly represent the rest of mankind. And then to further correlate to Isaiah 53 is that Jesus is laid in a new tomb. So he died with sinners, with the wicked, and then he was laid in a tomb with the rich. And he didn't have a bone broken, as was also prophesied. So to wrap this up, I want to look back at one of the pictures of Christ, and that was in Isaac. So just as Isaac was a willing participant when Abraham went to sacrifice on Mount Moriah, and even then Mount Moriah is the same mountain that the the temple was built on. It's the same mountain that they walked up to, to crucify Jesus. So Isaac was a willing participant And then Jesus was going willingly, carrying his cross, his implement of death, as Isaac carried the wood for the sacrifice going up with Abraham. And just another thing I want to point out is that Isaac was not a little kid at this point. He was a teenager. He would have known exactly what was going on. He even asked, where is the sacrifice? Where is the animal to be slaughtered? And Abraham said that the Lord will provide. And he got to the point where he was going up to the altar and about to to kill his own son. But Isaac was willing, and he was willing to the point of death, just as Jesus was. But Jesus died in his place. He was the sacrifice that the Lord provided in place for Isaac. He's the sacrifice that is in the place for us. So this is by no means an exhaustive look at the death of Christ, but I hope it shows you clearly that it was necessary that he died and it was effective to do exactly what he um, said would happen, exactly what the pictures in the Old Testament showed and exactly what they pointed toward. So Jesus is the scapegoat. Jesus' blood is the blood that's sprinkled on the mercy seat. He is the one who paid the cost between the covenant of God and Abraham. He is the one, he is like the, the Nehushtan, the snake on the, the bronze snake on the rod, that when they look upon that snake, they were saved. 
So there are so many pictures and they all point to Christ. And so many of them point specifically to his death. Um, and we'll, we'll leave it there, but that's not the end of the story as you know, but next week we'll go into um, what happens next.